Hello, good morning. It's eight o'clock and welcome to a special edition of BBC Breakfast. Yes, for the next hour, our focus is on the post office computer scandal and we will hear the stories of these nine victims of the largest miscarriage of justice in British history. We're going to take our time and they're going to tell us what happened to each of them in their own words. And some of them have never spoken publicly about this before. More than two decades on, it's taken a TV drama to catapult the scandal and campaign for justice into the limelight. There were more than 700 prosecutions, but so far only 93 people have had their convictions overturned. Rishi Sunak is expected to make a statement on the scandal at Prime Minister's questions in Parliament today. The former post office boss, Paula Venels, has handed back her CBE, but this morning she's facing growing pressure to return more than £2 million in bonuses. We'll be putting questions to the post office minister, Kevin Hollingrake, who's given full commitment to getting justice. So just what is his plan? But most importantly, we're going to be asking these victims of the scandal, what do they want to see happen next? So we've brought together these nine victims for the first time on live TV to hear about the impact this scandal has had on their lives and what they think should happen next. And over the next half hour or so, we're going to look at the issues of justice, about wrongful convictions, about compensation, accountability. Some of it is technical and complicated, but some of it is just human. Absolutely. And it's been going on for decades. So let's remind ourselves why you are all standing here together after more than two decades. Here's Tim Muffet. Basically, for every day. Used by the post office in night. But sub postmasters and Mr. Low concerns about fraud. Some of it is just human. Absolutely, and it's been going on for decades. So let's remind ourselves why you are all standing here together after more than two decades. Here's Tim Muffet. This is a story of injustice and ruined lives. I was destroyed. Of wrongful imprisonment, bankruptcy. It was just basically fighting for survival. Of broken marriages and, in some cases, suicide. I just struggle with it every day. My mental health is not that good. And it began with faulty software on a computer system called Horizon. Introduced by the post office in 1999. Developed by the Japanese company Fujitsu, Horizon was brought in to help with accounting and stock taking. But sub postmasters and mistresses complained about bugs in the system, which made it look like money had gone missing when it hadn't. Some tried to plug the gaps with their own money. Although concerns about the computer system were published in 2009, more than 700 post office branch managers were convicted of false accounting, theft and fraud between 1999 and 2015. In 2003, Alan Bates lost his contract as a sub-postmaster in North Wales when he refused to accept liability for alleged losses at his branch. He went on to set up the Justice for Sub-Postmasters Alliance. It's been the best or the worst unpaid job I've ever had. Uh, I mean, it, you just carry on with it day after day, and the more the more stories you hear the, from the victims, you know, you, you can't let it go. You've got to carry on with it. Daylight robbery. Toby Jones portrays Alan in the ITV drama that has shone new lights on the scandal. As the script came through, it was clear that this incredible injustice had been done whereby the computers had said that the postmaster had been defrauding them of money, which is a total computer glitch, and people were being convicted and people's lives had been completely ruined. In 2006, sub-postmaster Lee Castleton fought a civil case against the post office after it falsely accused him of stealing £35,000 from his branch in Bridlington in East Yorkshire. What, well, Alan, do you trust him? He lost the case, was ordered to pay costs and was declared bankrupt. All 
He is portrayed in the ITV drama by actor Will Meller. I don't know what price you can put on somebody losing their husband or losing your memories as a child because you've had to have treatment for depression or losing you know, your, your daughters or your kids getting spat at in the street. Your dad's a thief. You know, what price do you put on all that? You know, it, it's... So, I, yeah, I'm still angry, but I'm so glad I'm a part of this drama that has made it land with people and now the nation, the, the country are all behind these people. In 2019, the post office admitted there had been an IT fault and agreed to settle with hundreds of claimants. In September last year, the government said every sub-postmaster wrongly convicted would be offered £600,000 in compensation. But so far, only 93 convictions have been overturned and only 30 people have agreed full and final financial settlements. Paula Venels ran the post office between 2012 and 2019. She said yesterday that following mounting pressure, she would be handing back her CBE with immediate effect. So that was Tim Muffet with the story so far. And my goodness, hasn't it been going on for a long time? A long time, but here we are just 10 days into 2024 and suddenly it feels like everything's changed, doesn't it? A real change in the air politically, socially, and maybe now, finally, people, politicians are taking notice. Absolutely. And we do want to hear your stories. We want to try and understand that the impact that the Horizon scandal has had on all of your lives. We'll talk to you all in more detail, um, but we want to hear your story in your words. So we're going to ask each individual to tell that story. And Tom, can I ask you to start? Well, hello. I've got to say, I've been looking forward to this day. I'm Tom Hedges. I ran a post office at Hogsthorpe, which is about eight miles outside Skegness. I was there for 16 years until I was dismissed in 2009 and convicted in court in 2010. I had to wait a number of years until 2021 when my, my conviction was overturned. And frankly, it wrecked my life, my family's life, and everybody I know's life. It was the most horrendous thing I have ever been through. I was very lucky in one way. I didn't go bankrupt like a lot of the other people. Um, and I just feel very privileged to sit here this morning and address the nation because of the wonderful TV show that the ITV have produced. Which seems a weird thing to say on the BBC, but there we go. <laughs> uh, it, I do feel that this, that story has dragged us right onto the very top of the media agenda, and I'm very, very pleased that that's the case. Maria? Hi, um, my name's Maria, I'm from Huddersfield. This is the first time I've ever felt strong enough to speak to anyone about what's happened. Um, my contract, my, they terminate my contract after I pay back more than £30,000 back to them. 30000 Yeah. Alison. My name's Alison Hall. I ran a post office in Hightown, Liversidge, West Yorkshire, until I was suspended in 2010 of a shortfall of nearly £15,000. I admitted to false account in charge, which was overturned four year, three years ago. Um, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. We'll give you time yeah. as the programme goes on. Yeah. My name is Mohammed Rasul. I ran, worked for the post office for 27 years and then I was uh, convicted of false accounting. I had to wear a tag for uh, three months and had a suspended sentence for 12 months. I've carried the shame ever since. I refuse to carry it any longer. My name is Janet Skinner. I was um, worked for the post office from 1994 until um, I was suspended in 2006 for a shortfall of £59,000. I was given a nine-month custodial sentence, um, served for three months um, in prison and the rest on home care for you. It's affected everything of my, of my life going forward for the past 16 years. 
my name is Scott Darlington. I ran Alderley Edge Post Office for four years from 2005. I was suspended in 2009, convicted in 2010. Um, I couldn't get a job for three and a half years after that. I couldn't afford to pay for my daughter's school uniform. I suffered, suffered awful uh, stigma and uh, embarrassment and uh, financial distress ever since. And um, I'm glad that things have come to a head and we're able to speak about it now. Varshad. Hi, my name is Varshad Patel. I'm here on behalf of my father, Vip, Vipin Patel of Horse Park, Oxford. He was wrongfully prosecuted by Post Office Limited in 2011 and his health is completely shattered. It's, a, it's only going to get worse and he's not yet received co compensation. Uh, my name's Tim Brentnell. I ran uh, Roach Post Office in Pembrokeshire from 2005 until a shortfall was found in, in late 2009, which I was forced to pay back some £22,500. Um, I was then prosecuted for false accounting um, until my conviction was quashed in uh, 2001. Uh, my life was left in tatters and, and my customers and villagers thought I was a fraud. Uh, my name is Sally Stringer. Uh, I ran um, a small rural post office in Beckford for nearly, nearly 20 years. Um, I'm fortunate that I wasn't convicted. Um, I had to use my own money to pay for all the shortfalls from the corrupt horizon system. And I joined the 555 um, to see if I can help get justice. We need to have the monies that were paid to post office put back to the postmasters. Thank you all so much just for introducing yourselves and, and for going through that. I know how difficult it is for all of you and especially hard it is for those of you who've never done anything like this before. And it is immensely powerful for us sitting here and I'm sure for you sitting at home just, just to hear that. But I'm just reminded of the fact that you are 1% of all those who were wrongly accused. There are hundreds of people watching BBC Breakfast this morning who've been through exactly the same as you, and, and some of them even worse. Yeah. Maria, you've, you've never spoken before. What is it like now to have the country listening, the politicians listening? It's, um, it's been a long time coming. We've fought for a long time to get people to actually listen to us, and I'm really happy now that the government say that they are listening and we just want answers off the government to find out you know when are they going to pay what is rightfully back you know what the post office took from us we'll try and get some answers for you in, yeah. uh, in the next few minutes just wonder if we can ask that question sort of more broadly um to all of you that after all this time two questions if i get a show of hands after all this time do you finally feel that the communities that you're in that the public, that those people now have an understanding of all that you've been through? Hands, show of hands? Yeah. 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 That's everybody. Second question, those who are in charge, the politicians in charge, the post office, do you feel that they uh, are still listening, that they're listening and that something's going to happen? Hands up on that one. <laughs> Can you tell me? A bit wavy on that mm. one. So you're halfway there, and at least the communities, the public, because presumably uh, no, you have lived in these communities, and people didn't know what had gone on. They just saw the sign up saying the shop shut. No, they just saw the signs in the paper is what they've done and seen people being prosecuted for it. So then you're just all labelled as a, as a thief anyway. But the government have been aware of this for years. They've always been aware of it and they've just done nothing, they've just sat back. And it's basically because it's the, the, the height of social media has brought this story forward. It's it, the drama, the drama has given everybody an understanding, but also social media has pushed it forward, I think. And Janet, the impact on health, on mental health, but also physical health, just take us through how it's impacted you. Well, I mean, I, 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 I can't ever get a, a job. Well, I, I suppose I could, but I, I can't work physically because I have quite a lot of mobility issues, <clears throat> I have dexterity issues. Um, but there's also people that are still out there that need to come forward. So my, just, my thing today is just to say, you know, if you have been affected by this and you've got a story and you need help, 
come forward. There's a lot of people out there that are now prepared to help them because everybody now understands what we've been through. You went to prison? I did, yeah. What was that like? Horrendous. It's horrendous. It's the, it's the worst thing you just don't want to ever go through. I think it was harder as well because I had two, te two teenage... I don't want to answer that question. OK, don't worry, don't worry. <coughs> we, we will take our time here and you just... Uh, you compose your health self. But, Mohammed, I was really struck by you saying that you you carried this, this sense of of shame for, for, for years, that you, you, you felt you couldn't look people in the eye. No, well, I, <coughs> excuse me, I had a, quite a, a full social life. Uh, people came to my house regularly on a weekly basis for various um, uh, gatherings. And when this happened, I had to uh, cancel all those engagements. Um, I was totally a recluse. The only people that I met regularly was my family, my immediate family, my children and my wife. Even my parents didn't know about it. My siblings didn't. Um, it was, although I knew I hadn't done it, it was just the stigma attached that uh, you had to explain if anybody asked. You had to explain what had happened. And I just couldn't explain that something had happened which was totally out of my control and I had to justify it or defend it. I was... Uh, um, my shortfall was £12,000, which I paid uh, out of uh, my savings, what little I had, and some borrowed money, so that I wouldn't go to prison. If I hadn't paid that money up front, I would have ended up going to prison. You paid the money, but you'd done nothing wrong. <laughs> well, <laughs> I knew that. Yeah. And yeah, but our, <clears throat> all of us will tell you the same. We were all forced to pay money back. Yeah, I mean, over the years, I, I handed them about £60,000. Six, zero thousand. Yeah. 60, yeah. 60, yeah. Like 000. 60000 <clears throat> Over a long period. They take it out of your salary. You know, if you had a shortfall mm. and you contested it with, with the help desk or whatever, for example, if you t contested it in the January and said, I have done this, I want it sorted, and in the April you still get a letter demanding the money, then they take it out of your salary. Or you have to put it in... If you contest it, they then take it out of your salary. I mean, I was, I was very lucky. I was very lucky not to be in the position of some of these other people, but they really are beyond redemption, the post office. Beyond redemption. And uh, Tim, um, the same to you. I think your figure was, what, £22,000 that you, that you paid, but you were still charged, still convicted. Yeah, uh, an audit found a shortfall of £22,500, and I was told <coughs> if I didn't repay it, I'd be facing a theft charge. Uh, so I raided my savings, my parents' <coughs> savings, had to sell my car, um, and as soon as that was done, I was then charged with false accounting. We know that post offices are the heart of communities, they aren't were. they? Yeah, they, they were. were. Yeah. Yeah. But, but traditionally, over generations, they've been the place where we've met one another yeah. and chatted, and, and mm. your jobs in the post office are crucial for holding a community together. Alison, how, how, did, how was your standing in the community affected when, when this happened to you? I, I couldn't tell anybody. Um, it was really hard when I got suspended um, from the post office because my shop is just in the same building. So people was asking me, why are you not behind the post office counter anymore? And I just had to say, oh, I've, I've had a fallout with them. Um, I don't want to work behind there anymore. I've, I've finished, but I couldn't tell anybody the truth. It was all in my family and close friends what knew the actual truth, why I wasn't behind the post office counter and it took me a long, long time to, to talk about it. What was going on inside when, when you were trying to off. put on a... You did... I switched off. My partner, Richard, just did everything for me to, you know, finding um, the soup postmasters, just as the boat soup postmasters and I just, I just switched off. I kind of... I didn't know what to do, and it was just um, horrendous. And then still taking me to court, you know, they, they still took me to court. And... It also 
extends to your family. Mm. Yeah, it does, yeah. My eldest daughter, Kate, is an estate agent. And about a week or ten days after I was convicted, and it was all over the local press, because they love that type of thing, she went to value a house in the village a mile or two from the village where we lived, went into this house, did all the business, measured up, took all the photos, and for the entire 20 minutes she was in there, the couple that owned it <coughs> were telling her about this terrible, awful man down at that post office. He's stolen all the pensioners' money. He is a rogue. He only got us suspended. He should have been chucked in prison and thrown away the key. She, came, she held it together while she was in there, but the moment she got in her car outside, she spent 20 minutes crying because this, this couple had no idea that she was my daughter. Oh, and to this day, when, last week, when the, the mm. uh, drama was put on, both of my daughters could not watch an episode right the way through. They could watch about 10 minutes before they had to pause it, compose themselves, and watch the next bit. I think it's worse for your family than it was possibly for me, but then I'm a stronger character, perhaps. I don't know. My daughter suggested that um, a lot of people are saying to her about, oh, my God, I can't believe what's going on in the drama. And she said, and I'm sat there, and she said, they're saying to me, I can't believe what, what's happened. And she said, I've lived it. And it wasn't until yesterday I realised that my daughter actually is actually the age now that I was when I was sent to prison. How old is that? that? <clears throat> She's 35. 35? Yeah. She's the same age as what I was when I was sent to prison. And Varj, as of course your, uh, your father isn't here today, you're here on his behalf. What would he like you to say? Um, well, my father, he was wrongfully, wrongfully pro uh, prosecuted for shortfalls in excess of £75,000 um, in the year of 2010 and 2011. I mean, his standing in the community went. Uh, he was... There was... For, for example, there were wanted dead or alive posters circulated of my father. It was really, really horrible. For... What, in the community? Yeah. Yeah, it's, it, it's absolutely shocking. Um, uh, um, there was intimidation, which... It, and I say this um, evidently. At one point, they, they even built a four-foot cross. Um, they placed a wreath on it outside the shop on the village green, um, carved in R.I.P., and put um, a paper to, uh, to, uh, to say Vipin, so rest in peace, Vipin, right outside our shop. They and on another on another occasion, they were even having meetings um, uh, to block our business driveway and our private driveway. And again, this is evidential um, to drive mum and dad out of the village because they effectively saw my father as a post office robber. And um, and was, how, how did that affect you as his son? I, every time I went back to uh, the village in Oxfordshire, uh, I was taunted by so, some by some of the councillors. It was horrible. Um, at times, I didn't feel as if I wanted to show my face uh, outside of the shop. Um, at one point, I was even scared to even go outside of the shop. Um, and my, my father was always worried every, every, every time I was outside of the premises in case they, they started to pick on me. That's her, it's horrendous. It really is, Scott. Um, yeah. Do these comments, is, is this something you Yeah, pretty much. I mean, um, I wanted to plead not guilty, uh, but I was advised to plead guilty because um, we didn't have the information. They held all the cards, you know, all, all the, 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 the post office held all the cards, so we couldn't... And Scott, were you one of those told that it's, it's only you? Well, actually, I can't remember them saying that to me, um, but I've heard it from everybody. They, they might well have said it to me, but I can't vouch for the fact that they said that to me. But uh, I wanted to plead not guilty, but because we couldn't have any inf get any information, the barrister said to me, you, if, you don't, if you plead uh, not guilty, you're probably going to go to prison. So I had to plead guilty. So then I'm in the, the newspapers as pleading guilty, so I just presumed everybody thought I'd had my hands in the till. Uh, queuing up to pick my daughter from school, parents had seen me in the papers pleading guilty, I'm supposed to be the 
postmaster, and you know, and, and I knew I hadn't done anything. And th and I, how am I supposed to get out of this situation? You know, and it's taken all of these years to get to this point. You know, now I too got similar um, uh, information from my lawyer, who said, if you plead, uh, if you plead not guilty. I can guarantee you will go to prison. Mm. He He's... said, no jury in the land would believe that a, an institution as cherished, cherished as the post office, mm. could possibly have a computer system that is rubbish. He said, they just won't believe it. He said, the only thing you can do if you are frightened of going to prison, and believe you me, I was petrified, mm. plead not guilty. He said, I've got 95 per cent chance I'll keep you out of prison by That's saying some I nice... That's why I was guilty to false counting, so that I didn't get sent to prison. Yeah, and you but still dangled. And, those, and they back, gave Cartel back, and, and as usual, and the post office gave back word. For, yeah. uh, Always. People. We're going to speak to the post office minister in mm -hmm. a moment, but just mm -hmm. very quickly, what kind of strength does it give you to sit here together, to have found one another, to have this community? We had this strength was... when we was the 555. Mm. Yeah. Um, yeah. I yeah. think, we, but we, we, because we all sort of lived in all over the UK, we've not really all got together as a group yeah. as such, because we was at one half, and then we had the other, uh, um, the south and the north, wasn't it? Yeah, I'm the um, the, the Where north, weren't we? For me, was just sat in that village hall. Yeah. Me too. And just me too. looking and talk and thinking, these people are telling my story, but I've yeah. never met these people. But yeah. somebody else was speaking what had happened to me, and it were, it were quite. I've always said it's quite, it was quite bizarre that day, mm. yeah. um, just to meet people who had my story, but I'd never met them before. Yeah. Strength and, in numbers. I'm yeah. Worried, mm. Perhaps at this point we should reflect on the fact that there are simply some people who aren't here now. Mm. Yeah. 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 They never right. receive justice. Yeah. I also do think that we, we will be better off as a large group together now. The media has taken us on board and I do believe that we have an institution that is old and established to deal with as, as a group and the country needs to look at it too. OK, well, let's all now listen to the post office minister who mm. joins us live, Kevin Hollinrake. Uh, we're understanding that the government say they're going to leave no stone unturned in seeking justice, that they're going to repair the damage that's been done and do it quickly. Mr Hollingrake, good morning. We are all ears. Uh, when are we going to hear what the government plans to do to help these people? Well, very soon. <coughs> As I when? committed to on the, on the floor of the House on Monday, it will be this week. Uh, clearly, these are very significant steps we are about to take, or potentially will take. Um, there are, in terms of the people who have been convicted, not enough have come forward. Only 93 of the 983 have so far had those convictions overturned. We're determined to accelerate that. There are only two ways to do it. Either we do that on a case-by-case -case basis, which takes time, um, or we do it en masse. We do it a blanket overturning of those convictions which is a very significant step because that interferes with the judicial process. But we know what a, what a huge scandal this has been, both the depth of it and the scale of it. So we are looking at, at unprecedented steps to deal with this, but these are significant decisions we've got to make. But we're keen to announce those decisions this week. We believe we have a solution, not just to overturning the convictions, but also to speeding up compensation for the, the, the group that's with you today, the 555. So both those things are things we are working on. We're determined to give you a solution this week. Mr Hollingrake, uh, we understand that Rishi Sunak might be saying something about this today. It is, of course, Prime Minister's question time. Can we expect something as soon as today? Well, I hope so, but I can't confirm that because, as I say, these are very, very complex issues and uh, there are different legal opinions of whether we're doing the right thing if we did this on a, uh, on a blanket basis, if we overturn this through legislation, because you are interfering with the independence of the courts. And that may seem bureaucratic or uh, uh, not a logical problem, um, but it is a very significant problem, very significant legal uh, thing, a step we potentially will take. But we know we have to do something very, very significant to resolve this matter as quickly as we'd like to resolve it so we are we are considering these things very carefully as quickly as you would like to resolve it now given the pressure that this tv drama has put you under as a government but let's be really really honest 
it is the case, isn't it, that if it wasn't for that drama on telly last week, you wouldn't be dealing with it quickly, you wouldn't be dealing with it at all right now. Uh, that's absolutely not the case. Both as a backbencher, I spoke on this issue in 2021 about the, the 555 group you're with right now, or making sure those people had compensation. I've been working on this for my 15 months as personal minister. My number one priority, we've been looking at the issue with the overturning the convictions. Looking uh, at it, months, yes, now, looking at it, but not necessarily not dealing with it, not necessarily coming up with the solutions that now all politicians of all parties seem to be racing desperately to reach. Well, I said the media's got a great interest in it as well, which I really welcome that the, you have got this, taken this interest in this now. Of course, it makes my life easier as personal minister <coughs> to convince other parts of government and, other, and the opposition and others to do something very, very significant. I welcome that. But to say nothing's been happening is just absolutely not the truth. Both myself and my predecessors, they've been absolutely determined to deal with this. But what you're talking about potentially, which is a blanket overturning of convictions, a, 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 le a a, a, some legislation that does that interferes with the courts. In, the courts are independent in this country for a good reason. So it's a very, very significant legal step we're, we may be about to take. So that's why I can't give you an answer right now, but I hope to give you an answer very, very shortly. Mr Hollingrake, as you know, we are surrounded by those who've been most deeply affected uh, by this scandal. So if you don't mind, um, we will throw it open to them to ask you questions, if you're OK with that. And Very I'd like to, to start with, uh, with Janet, Janet Skinner, who, of course, imprisoned. Yes. My question to you is, you are the Post Office Minister. Is the government going to take back control over the Post Office? Currently, the Post Office, they are orchestrating convictions. Who has a conviction of, who has a conviction of 10? They're in control of the compensation. They are now classified as the criminals, so why aren't they having the power to control everything? Well, Janet, I was talking about your case very, uh, yesterday with David Davis, which I think uh, Sir David Davis, who I think has been working on your behalf, very keen to resolve that issue, and we're very keen to take this out of post office hands. So that's, in short answer, yes, that's what we're, we are keen to do. But I can't confirm that right at this moment in time, but I'm very keen to, to confirm it very, very shortly. You can understand why these people just want the post office to be taken out of this whole process. Yeah. They, they, I they control completely. everything. This yeah. is the problem. They've always controlled everything. And they've been allowed to control everything. And the government's sitting there saying, yeah, we're taking notice. They've been aware of this for the past 10 years and done nothing. That's, I mean, that's fair. I mean, you say you've, you've been working on it very hard as a minister. I, I don't want to question that. <clears throat> uh, and you say your, your predecessors have as well. But can you understand why the public and these people feel that this is just taken too long? Why didn't you do this, address this act sooner? Yeah, I, I can understand that completely. And we'd be frustrated too. And you do one thing and you think it's going to work very quickly. So when the first convictions were overturned in 2021, we thought there would be a huge wave of, of people coming forward to overturn those convictions. We probably hadn't anticipated some of the, uh, some of the uh, nervousness around uh, people might have about reopening their case, about go going back through a legal process, about interacting with the post office again. So that's why we've been looking at different options in terms of overturning these convictions more rapidly and indeed compensating people more rapidly. What we did some months ago now, back in the autumn, we brought forward for people who have had convictions overturned a different route to compensation. At the moment, compensation claims are complex, of course, because every, everybody's situation is different. We gave people the option of taking a fixed sum award of £600,000, tax-free, uh, and we did that, let's say, last autumn because we wanted people to come forward. We wanted more people to come and access compensation and overturn those convictions. That has helped. Uh, a significant proportion of the 30 people people who have accepted compensation have gone down that route okay. and we see more people come forward on that basis but not enough have and that's why we're, we're keen to make these changes we're talking about making in the next few days. A lot of, ex okay, sorry, a lot of executives are getting near enough up to £600,000. Do you think that that's fair that somebody has had their life turned inside out and upside down? Yeah. You're offering them £600,000. I think that's just an easy cop out. Well, in, in terms of executives responsible within the post office for what's happened in the past, we've got the statutory inquiry, of course. Sir Wynne Williams is, is chairing that inquiry. That will report by the end of the year or conclude 
by the end of the year and report soon after. By then we'll be able to identify who's responsible for what happened to the, to the people you, that are with you today. And, uh, and at that point in time, decisions can be taken on whether those people are prosecuted or what financial sanctions might be, might be imposed on those people. All those organisations, and of course Fujitsu has been one of the organisations that people have been talking about, I think quite rightly, because we don't feel the taxpayer alone should pick up the tab for, these, for the compensation that we're paying to postmasters. Minister, we've got lots of questions, as you can imagine. Uh, Tim, I think you wanted to ask a question. Well, yeah, what mechanisms are you actually going to put in place um, to speed up compensation for everyone? Because I know as someone who had their conviction quashed in uh, 2021, we're now two and a half years later with nothing happening. Um, many people have, have far greater or more complex claims. Um, so why can't you pay that £600,000 as an interim payment to everybody and allow people to go on to claim if they feel their claims are bigger, but also people without convictions um, compensation for everybody what mechanisms can be put in place to sort all of this out yeah very fair question and the interim payment for somebody with a conviction is 163,000 pounds the 600,000 pounds is an alternative to full and it's a full and final settlement alternative rather than going down the more complex route of full of detailed assessment one advantage of the fixed sum, if people choose that route, it takes people out of the queue, so it should mean compensation delivered more rapidly for the other people waiting for compensation claims to be assessed. Um, of course, we've looked at that for, for potentially for other schemes as well. And I say one of the things we're hoping to do when we do make an announcement is, is um, make an announcement on what we're doing to speed up compensation for the people in the 555 as well. So that's something that will hopefully form part of that announcement. Minister Varchas is, is also here on behalf of his father who has... Uh suffered terribly with his health and therefore can't be with us uh, in the studio. Vartis, what's your, what's your question? Hi, Minister. Um, you said in Parliament the other day to my MP, Dr Rupert Huck, that everyone with an overturned conviction is entitled to an interim payment. Yet, despite the courts overturning my father's conviction with no stain on his record, him, him being an a, a innocent man, post office and its lawyers have refused to pay my father and a number of others interim payments. Their, their convictions are overturned. Why has three years gone by and my father has not received the £163,000 interim payment? That's a very fair question, and we've corresponded on Twitter, Varches, I think, uh, about this. So um, we are looking at your father's case. Um, your, uh, the case, rightly or wrongly, was seen not to be related to the Horizon scandal itself, and you, you may well contest that. But I've been talking to this about this, and your case and others, to the advisory board, on which sits James Abbott, Lord Abuthnut, and Kevin Jones, key campaigners, about your particular kind of case and we're keen to find a solution when we do announce a solution that covers your kind of your father's kind of case as well. One more question, sorry. If yeah, you of course. Um, will, will the investigators who, well, the employees, the past employees, the so-called investigators within the post office, who apparently investigated everyone's ca um, ca uh, cases for, sh for short for sh shortfalls, will, will they be investigated and prosecuted if appropriate? Uh, well, the answer is yes. If people are guilty of something that we can, that the authorities can prosecute them for, then yes. We don't. Again, police are independent of parliament as well, so they'll make decisions on who they prosecute. But the Wynne Williams inquiry, and I know that our law enforcement authorities are already looking at the evidence that's coming out from the inquiry. But um, but the Sir Wynne Williams inquiry, when it concludes, all that evidence will will be available to any authority. So prosecutions potentially can follow for whoever's guilty of whatever they're guilty of and also potentially financial sanctions to help contribute to the taxpayer's bill. Thank uh, you. Minister, I think Mohammed just wanted to clarify the situation going forward and the role of the post office. Is that right, Mohammed? Yes, that's right. <clears throat> I just wanted to know what, whether the post office will still have a say in who gets their convictions quashed or not. Well, that's not what we want to happen, Mohammed. I mean, we want it to be a case that we take that out of their hands and we provide a solution that's much more rapid and, and dealt with separately from the post office. So the answer is, short answer is no, they won't have. Sally, I think you've got a question. Yeah, yeah, Mr. I've, got a, I've got a question for you as a daughter of a Far East POW. Um, 
about Fujitsu. Fujitsu seem to have managed to accumulate substantial contracts from the governments over the years. Um, and I, I believe that they should be held responsible for some of the compensation. It'll ease government coffers a little bit. But um, what is your opinion about Fujitsu taking more contracts on and also their behaviour with the post office? Well, I may well agree with you, uh, but I think we need to go through a process. And uh, so that process is underway now. We, Parliament set up a statutory inquiry, is looking at responsibility. Uh, what we do, I think quite rightly, our, uh, the way our system works is we have, these in, we have these inquiries, it takes evidence, reaches conclusions. If it identifies who's responsible, and there are some questions about who's more responsible for Jitsu or post office or others, when, we're, when the inquiry is identified responsibility, then those questions can be answered, then those, uh, then those conversations will be had. But Minister, you sure haven't people... actually said, you haven't actually said, are you going to continue giving Fujitsu government contracts as a result of their past history with Horizon? I mean, Horizon well, we is faulty. We don't know the history yet. You may have made a judgment already. We want to reserve judgments until the inquiry is completed okay. and it reaches a conclusion. A classic then we government can give up. Kind of Thank you. A classic government give up is, is how Sally's describing oh. that. I mean, you say we don't know the issue with Fujitsu, with, with Horizon. We, we, we know that computer system didn't work and it's still being used in post offices across the country, isn't it? I know it's been repaired, but that's not right, is it, Minister? Well, the, the, the reality, how our, our legal process works in the UK, and this is, you know, this is a... Uh, an inquiry set up by statute, set up by Parliament. We take evidence, we don't reach a conclusion until the end of that inquiry. Once we've reached that conclusion, then we can take the actions potentially that the, uh, the people with you want to see us take. And I'm, I'm very sympathetic to that perspective. And I may, you know, I can see how people, some people will have made up their mind, but I don't think it's right to make up their mind based on a, on a dramatisation. I don't mean that um, Minister, to say this trivially. Minister, I'm going to interrupt you again because I'm getting very angry with this. One, one second. This, Sorry. this is a, a, one of the worst miscarriages in justice that this country has ever seen. Fujitsu are part of it, post office are the other part of it. And the government pays both. You own Post Office Limited. Now, I want some answers, please, from ministers, including you, about what you are going to intend to do about the post office and Fujitsu. I don't want it at the end of an inquiry because I trust the inquiry to find the answers. But I'm also asking you in an election year what you as a government are intending to do about it. And I want some answers fairly quickly, please, because most of these people that have suffered on this need their compensation. And I they've had that. long that's enough, that's frankly, that, to faff that's around that's with this government and previous governments. And you need to get it sorted soon. We want some time scales, please. Well, the inquiry is not getting in the way of your compensation. The first thing I would I'd say, we're, we're, we, can ra we can more rapidly deliver compensation to you and others uh, aside from the inquiry. But my, uh, the point on the, and we're, we're keen to do that, and hopefully that will be part of the announcement we make this week. But the, in terms of individual responsibility or organisational responsibility, it is our position, and I, and I support this, is that we let the inquiry do its work and then we identify those responsible and then we impose sanctions on those that are responsible, be it uh, prosecutions or asking people to contribute to the taxpayers' bill for compensation. We are aware for the post office, each and every one of us, which is the reason why we're here. But they already took sanctions on everybody else, so they, they accused everybody straight away without having any evidence. So why does that make any difference to how you're, you're saying the process is going to be now? Yeah. Well, I think they were totally wrong to do that, and it's and it's absolutely the wrong thing now to to uh, do something else that's that's against the way the system should work in that way. We got here in the first place by not proper uh, without we got to a position where people were asked to asked to make good shortfalls or were convicted without proper analysis of the evidence. We don't want to do that as a government. It would compound the original office. error. Are you going to, to stop private prosecutions with the post office? That's some, uh, pr the post, post office are not doing private prosecutions, haven't done 20, since 2015. They should not do private prosecutions. 
anybody in this country, individual or company, can undertake a private prosecution. This is not a specific right of the post office, but the Justice Secretary is looking at this uh, across the whole uh, uh, across the whole landscape. Well, no, not a okay. specific right from the post office. It was a specific right that was owned by the Royal Mail that the post office adopted when they separated in 2012. Can I just say, one of the issues that a lot of our viewers are asking about this morning is Paula Venels. We know that yesterday she handed sure. back her CBE after a huge amount of uh, public pressure on her. Uh, a lot of people are saying this morning that she should hand back some of the bonuses and pension advantages that she's had over suspended. the years. Yeah. I was just wondering, from all of you here in the studio, if I could ask you to raise your hands, please, if you think that she should have to hand back those bonuses and pensions. Yeah. And so should Nick Reid, the current one. OK, yep. that's unanimous, Minister. What do you say to that? Well, I was, I think, one of the first people to say that Paula Minnell should hand back her CBE, which I think she's agreed to do that voluntarily. And her bonuses? Uh, sorry? And her bonuses? The bonuses, bonuses she's... Well, as I say, I, I think we need to go through due process. I know the people with you will not be happy about that, but I think that's the, the system we run. We don't do this by trial by media. We do this by running a process and inquiry, all those answers and all those sanctions and the enforcement actions can be taken at the end of the inquiry when we know the actual evidence, who's responsible and the conclusions, who's specifically responsible, was it the post office, was it Fujitsu, was it, uh, was it individuals within the post office? Was it we, government? We may well have was made our government? mind up about that individually, but I think we should go through a process. OK. Minister, thank you very much indeed. I know it's a, thank you. it's a difficult situation sitting on the other end of a line and you've got these guys here and us chipping in with questions, but we do appreciate your time. We asked the, the guys here at the beginning whether they felt that they were being listened to, whether you felt politicians were listening to you. Give us a show of hands again, maybe. Do, do, do you feel like you've got what you wanted from the minister this morning? Have you got the answers? Hands up. No, no I'm in London later, so I might pop and see you. <laughs> <laughs> oh, there we go. <laughs> I'm going back to London. If the minister's still there, Maria's coming to see you. You're going to the inquiry, are you? I am, yes. <laughs> what will you be telling the inquiry? I'm not. I'm actually watching one of my investigators who helped sent me to prison. To hear them give evidence? Give evidence, yeah, tomorrow. And what are you expecting to hear? What do you want to hear? What do you um, need to I've hear? Brought a note, I've brought a notepad just to write down, I don't recall, I don't remember. It's just to, I'm going to calculate just to see how many times he says it. <laughs> so you've got called for amnesia. <laughs> That's, That's another problem. In the inquiry in has got... The people from the post office have a major medical issue, which is corporate amnesia. Yeah. Yeah. And they're produced with a piece of paper that they've written an email on. No, it comes up on the screen. It's from them. And they are actually not able to recall it for some unknown reason. It's, it's... They've all signed non-disclosure agreements, a whole lot of them, and they are not responding to the lawyers who are asking them questions. And it is nauseating to sit and watch some of these people lie. It is a reminder that the inquiry again back tomorrow, isn't yes. it? Start, restarts oh, tomorrow. tomorrow. Yeah. Um, Tom, do you have any faith in the inquiry that it's going to give you answers that you need? I, I do actually have faith, because I, I worked out fairly early that Wynne Williams has worked out... He's a good man. ...what a pile of SH1T <laughs> the uh, post office are, were, and they don't seem to be getting an awful lot better. I mean, all the scandal we had earlier in the year when the current CEO paid himself and other executives a bonus for doing the job they were supposed to do anyway. I mean, it's unbelievable that that could be the case. It's 480 million quid he got as a bonus. Eh? Uh, no. 480,000. Sorry, 480,000. Oh, I was going to say, it's just over 400,000, not 480 million. He, he, he only paid back as I understand it, about 10% of that. Yeah. We don't know that, do we? Yeah. We don't he's, know. He's it, not it, is yeah, exactly. it is speculation. It is speculation. Do you know what I'm wondering? I'm just seeing these post office signs on our studio this Take morning, and we all walk past post offices in our communities, on our high streets, in our towns and villages, cities, every day, don't we? <laughs> when you see that sign, after everything you've been through, what does no, it make you think? I don't like it. Um, I've not been in a post office ever since um, I was convicted. What, you've ne not stepped foot? Never stepped foot in one. What, you can't? I just won't, no, that's right. I, I can't stand even to see the signs. No. 
You know, when I walk through a town and I see one, I think, oh, not, no. Or even the vans going past, anything with the post office sign on it. It's, um, Especially it's, when they, they still try and sell themselves as, as the most trusted yeah, player in the yeah, country. Yeah. And they've had to it, remove that, um, I think it was not last year, the year before. Do you know what? I feel sorry for the people who are currently running the local post offices. Yeah. Oh, they yeah. do need... Yeah. They, they just need support. They don't need slander. It's not them that's created this issue. Yeah. They're just stuck in this position of trying to earn a living. So, I mean, do I boycott them? No, I don't. I support my local post office because I knew... Well, I know what it was like for me. Yeah. It's been so important for us to hear all your stories. We started off by each of you individually talking about how you've been affected. I wonder if we could just ask each of you individually again, uh, starting with Tom, one thing going forward that you think needs to be done, and I'll ask each of you. So, Tom, one thing. Speed up the compensation. Mm. Maria? Yeah. Final redress for everybody. Speed up the compensation. Speed up the compensation. Mohammed, one thing. Complete declaration of all these sub-postmasters are innocent at their offices, at their relative offices where they worked. Poster to say that uh, post office have wrongly convicted them and they're sorry. So public exoneration exactly. in each post office. <clears throat> Janet? Accountability. I want accountability. I mean, compensation, people can't put a time frame on that. But it's accountability, it's what we need. And people need to be persecuted the same way we have. Scott? Uh, same, the conversation sorting out. And the people who um, were the perpetrators need to be brought to, to account, otherwise it won't feel like justice. Bartis, what do you think your dad will be thinking as he watches this morning? <laughs> um, for the post office to accept liability, because Horizon was intrinsic to his wrongful prosecution, and pay my father an interim payment. Yeah, speed up compensation for everybody and speed up the quashing of convictions. Sally? Yeah, and likewise, with the compensation, I think that needs to be done sooner rather than later. And also, the accountability has to be properly done and we have got to be trusting the people that do it. Maria, you'd never spoken about this publicly before and you've spoken oh, yeah, well, no. about it <clears throat> to millions of people on UK television this morning. What does it feel like to have gone public and had your say? Um, it feels good for these good people around me. Um, without these, <clears throat> I couldn't have done this today. Well, we really appreciate all of you coming in and, and talking really to us. Do. Thank you so much for your time. And we'll Thank keep you. in touch with you. You keep in touch with us. Mm -hmm. We'll keep across this and try to get some more answers, right? Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. So conversation much. stopping here for the moment, but Nikki Campbell is continuing this conversation on BBC Radio 5 Live, <clears throat> excuse me, after nine o'clock, and he joins us now. Nikki, we've had a real sense uh, this morning of the, the, what's gone on over the last, well, <clears throat> 20 years or so. Give us a sense of the mood from your callers. We've been overwhelmed, and I've just got to say, the last um, 50 minutes television has been incredible. Um, I've I've been so profoundly moved by it, um, hearing the sadness and the frustration and and, and the disbelief um, and the anger from those good people that you have there. And I'm I'm honoured to say that uh, six of, of those amazing people have agreed to come into our studio this morning and speak to our audience. We're on Five Live. We're going to be on BBC News. We're going to be on BBC Two as well. And it gives a chance to further tell the story. And there's so much to tell, I know, but also uh, for our listeners and viewers indeed to speak to them as well. So that's happening at nine. And you can ask a question now, text 85058 at your standard message rate. So that's coming up. Thanks, Nikki. So many of you will be uh, on Five Live continuing to tell your story, taking questions from callers as well. So many people, and you have the support of so many people. And I can't tell you how many messages we've had from our viewers this morning. I've never seen anything like it. Literally, <laughs> while you've been speaking, thousands and thousands of texts and WhatsApps and emails. Yeah. It's unbelievable. We need to get you some cups of tea and coffee. <laughs> <laughs> well, you haven't even given you any water. You know, something stronger. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure the bar's open. We'll see what we do. Oh, thank you, thank so, you so much. much. Clearly, this conversation is going to continue a little bit later than normal, but you'll understand why. It's time now to get the news, the travel and the weather where you are.